in the house of God again this morning? I mean expecting. How many come expecting? Amen. You come expecting? Praise God. If we that many people? <laughs> Boy, things are going to get right in this place. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father God in heaven, Father, you see the hands of those that come in expecting. Lord, they've come to worship and magnify your wonderful and holy name. Father, they've come to give you praise, <laughs> honor, and glory. For, Lord, you are the God of their life, the God of their soul. And, Lord, they've put their confidence and total trust in you. Lord, they've come to receive of you. Lord, to be not only blessed of you, O oh God, but to be able to turn that blessing around and, O oh God, to be able to praise and magnify your name. Lord, let us lift you up today. Let us do all things to the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ, our Savior. <coughs> Father, we ask you for your blessing. We ask you for your anointing upon our pastor. Lord, that you would lead him, guide him, direct him. Oh, Lord, give him of your anointing, the heavenly anointing of God, that he may speak your word and that our hearts may burn within us. And, Father, we praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' loving name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Stand with us this morning as we get ready to remind Satan that our God is not dead. He's alive and living and here for us today. Amen.
lettuce, but my baby's on the drums today. Yeah. So glad to have them home and so glad he could fill in for us today. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord? Yeah. Amen. We came here for one reason only, and that's to praise our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. So give him your very best today. <clears throat>
Sunday is Memorial Day, as you all, I'm sure, are aware of. So we are asking you to wear your best Memorial Day colors, so red, white, and blue. If you've got it, bring that next Sunday so we can celebrate those who have gone before us. And then in two weeks, what is in two weeks? VBS! VBS, two weeks. It is here, guys. So start inviting your friends and your family. It will actually start on June the 4th. We have a class for everybody, including the adults. We have it. It's just going to be a great, great time. If you still want to volunteer, see Becky O'Berry or Megan Oliver, and they will get you somewhere. But start inviting your kids. We want to, you know, we're, we're praying for at least 50 to 100 kids here. Are you believing with us? Amen. So you don't have to be a member of this church. Bring your neighborhood. We'll serve them. Amen. And then Chris has a youth announcement. All right. Yeah. VBS coming up. We need to get involved. We need, if we don't act and be involved, it won't happen. So we've got to be involved. If you notice this morning, over here to our left, I put a table. Each table, uh, this table has a bunch of envelopes numbered one through 100. And so this is our very last fundraiser for our youth trip. All idea is very simple. You pick, like I've picked two envelopes. I've picked 44 and 71. Okay, I picked my softball number and my high school football jersey number. <laughs> They're two of my favorite numbers. Say you pick the number five. Jack likes number five, that was his softball number. He gets number five. You're, we're basically pledging to put $5 in that envelope toward our youth trip, okay? It's not that hard. If you want to write a check, say you write number 50, just make it out to Kettle Creek Youth, put it in the envelope, hand it to myself, hand it to Stephanie, hand it to Jack, and we will get that into the youth account. Do not put these in the offering plate. Ms. Donna will have a fit. We don't want that. Just bring them to me, bring them to Stephanie, bring them to Jack, and we will get them put a de deposited in the youth account. We're going to run this for about five weeks, okay? Grand total, if you total one plus two plus three, it's over $5,000. Do we need $5,000? Not all of it, but it would be nice. Okay, we basically got the trip took care of. This is to basically cover food cost, gas cost. Have you bought a Happy Meal for your children lately? Yes. They ain't $4 no more. Uh, no, not no more. And a gallon of diesel gas, I don't know what it was seven years ago, the last trip, but it's, it's not what it used to be. So we got these expenses to take care of. That way, no one has to pay a dime to go on the youth trip. This is grade six through 12th, beyond. And uh, five weeks, get an envelope, pray over it. If you can't pay it this week, we're running it for five weeks, okay? Once you do it, fill it out, get it to me, get it to Stephanie. Thank you. Let us pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you for giving us another opportunity to come into your house. We thank you for all of the blessings you're pouring out on the church family and our community. We thank you, God, for all that you do. We thank you for this offering, and we thank you for blessing this offering to your work. In your name, in your name we pray. Amen.
God, once again, we thank you for the privilege of being in your house, dear God, to worship and praise you. We thank you, Father God, for this offering. We just pray that you would use it for your glory, dear God. We thank you for all you do for you, for your love, your saving grace, and we just give you the praise, Lord, and honor for all things. Amen. Amen.
Father, we are forever grateful for your love and your presence to your children. We thank you for being here this morning and allowing us to be here in your presence. And God, whenever we do that, all things become possible. We know there are needs here in the congregation today, physical, spiritual, emotional, financial. But God, we know that you have the answer if we could just trust you. So today I pray that these songs would get to our hearts and that we would offer praise and that we would be proud of the fact that we gave our best. And we pray, God, today for the word to come forth and for the word to touch, to cut asunder and to get it to the lowest parts of our bodies and to help us, God, inwardly to see you and understand you and to trust you. We thank you for what you have done and what you're going to do. And we just tell you we know you're an awesome God. And we sure love you. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's good to have everybody here this morning. We um, went through graduation this week, and we got three or four that are no longer in high school. I guess they're adults. One day they're children, the next day they're adults, and it all makes a difference with a diploma that a man wrote, individual. But congratulations to all of our graduates. Good to have their families here today. We, um, we see there's a, a lot of them here, and I'm thankful for that. Hope you had a great time with them and hope you continue to until you go. And when you travel back, we pray for God's safety to be upon you. It was good to have Dawson and Jess make it here. And Dawson, I didn't know you were playing drums, but thank you for doing that. But then I looked up yesterday and Crystal and Lauren Carolyn came in from Arkansas to be here for, to see me at the graduation. And I thought that was awful nice of them. And... Um, Whoever else is here that you've traveled, and you're, you know, thank you for being here. And visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. Now, we want to, I want to share a word with you this morning. I want you to open your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 9. Most of you in here have asked me when Brody's birthday was, and I want you to know it's today. So if you have presents for him, he'll be up here after the service, and you can bring them to him. And Brody turns 17 today, and I'm really proud of him. <laughs> All right, I want you to hold your place right there, and we're going to read from the, our book to begin with. If you have your book with you, turn to page 195, almost to the very back. If you don't have your book with you, I want you to listen anyway. Because as I read this, 
I will promise you one thing. This writing here is a sermon in itself. Didn't intend it to be that way, but it is. So pay close attention to what's said here. It says, every word that man speaks is recorded in heaven. You ever thought about that? Every word, not just your good words, not just your bad words. Every word we speak is recorded in heaven. No word or thought escapes the ears of God. Have you thought about that? No words or thoughts, the things that we think God hears. We don't, but God hears it. And we will be judged according to our conversation, what we say. Father, my goal is to glorify you. My desire is to offer praise to you continually. I do not want to speak. Now listen to this. I do not want to speak an idle or a negative word, an untimely or a hasty word, a false or deceptive word, or a harmful or hateful word. My speech reflects my heart. I hope you know that. Protect my thoughts and make my tongue holy. My goal is for my words to reproduce the love of Christ. My goal is that my words would reproduce the love of Christ and to be pleasing unto him. My lips will produce godly words for he produces my thoughts. If God could have total control of us, if we, if we would just give up and let him have total control, then even our thoughts would glorify him because he would be directing our thoughts. Kind words are good medicine. I thank God for those words. I, I guarantee you it's a sermon in itself. If we could have all heard that with our heart, we could say amen right now and just leave, beat the Baptist to the chicken house and sit there and enjoy it. But since we didn't do that, I'm going to share with you. Acts 9, verse 31. It said, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and they were multiplied. Wouldn't you love to have that said about Kettle Creek Church? Think about it. Wouldn't that be a great thing? That not we say it, but someone around us would say it. Think about this. And then had Kettle Creek, it was edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. That we walked in the fear of the Lord. That the Holy Ghost strengthened us and led us. And he said, when that happens, the church will be multiplied. What a thought. Now, as this happened, the chapter 9 talks about Paul and his experience on the Damascus Road, one that changed his life forever. And he went from a savage, cruel, hateful revengeful person to a loving, kind, generous disciple of Christ. But Paul had a great problem 
in that he had spent this part of his life persecuting Christians. And then all of a sudden, when God got a hold of him, the love of God took over. And now, rather than persecuting, he wants to comfort. But the problem is, he's been so mean to the Christians that they don't trust him. <laughs> and, and he says, I want to help you. They said, no, it's a trap. Because he would arrest them, put them in chains, take them back, put them in a dungeon, and there they would live or die. He had authority to do that. So anytime he came to a group of Christians and wanted to teach them or preach to them, they didn't trust him because they thought it was a trick and he was going to arrest them. So he had a hard time, but he didn't care. He just preached the gospel because now he had been changed. His life was forever going to be different. Even though they rejected him, then they tried to kill him. And some of the people heard about it, put him in a basket, put him over the side of the walls, and he escaped. But all he did was go to Jerusalem then and begin to preach more and teach more. And we see where the gospel was beginning to be spread. No longer were the disciples staying in a place in the upper room or somewhere. Now they were spreading out. Remember Jesus had told them, not go into the world and preach or teach my gospel to all people. And they were beginning to do that, not realizing even what they were doing, but they began to do it. And the gospel was now being spread. But they still wouldn't accept Paul. Even the disciples of Christ thought that it was a trick and they didn't trust him. So one day the Holy Spirit gets a hold of Barnabas. And tells Barnabas that I want you to take Paul to the disciples. And I want you to introduce him and let them know he's one of us. And Barnabas did just that. And the disciples then accepted Paul. And Paul just continued to go on and preach. There was another attempt on his life. But he was spared. Now this is the story of chapter 9 up to where we, were, where we read today. It's a very interesting chapter, and you can say, well, that's good reading, and it all took place just like you said, but there is something that we need to understand if we're going to understand the message today. God directed everything that happened in chapter 9. He brought Paul to the, to the Damascus Road, and you can say, well, that was the way he was traveling anyway. No, God brought him right there to that place. And when Paul touched that place in the road, the power hit him and changed his life forever. He was then taken blind for three days, and we've talked about that before. He didn't see the world. He didn't see anything for three days. Then he's healed and set free and now go preaches the gospel. God directed everything that Paul did, every step he took God was directing. When he brought him to Barnabas, God directed that meeting. And there Barnabas goes and takes him to the disciples, and God directed that meeting. Everything was done through the direction of Paul, of God, and the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden, it changes. Just, it's just like Paul died. I mean, it's just he didn't, but just like he did. And the next verse says, and it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters. And that switches, and we're going to talk about Peter. So it says, as Peter passed through all quarters. We see Peter now taking the gospel and beginning to deliver it to other people. The gospel is being spread. It's getting outside of Jerusalem. It's getting outside the boundaries that were placed there by the other people. Now it's beginning to move. And that's the great thing about the Spirit of God. He doesn't want us to be confined to these four walls. He's trying to show us that the gospel has got to get out of here. We've got to take it to the world. And where is the world? The people that you meet. 
we got to get it outside. If we want verse 31, and then he had the churches, there was rest throughout all of them. And the Holy Spirit began to move, and the churches began to grow. If we're going to grow in Christ, if we're going to grow in numbers, if we're going to grow anyway, it's because we're willing to get out of here and take the gospel to those who are lost and hurting out there. And that's what Paul did. And it says, as he did that, the churches began to accept Christ because he was going to different places. The church as, not the church, began to grow in Christ. And then it says, and now Peter began to go about to all quarters. So we see Peter now going to different churches, preaching the gospel to all of them. And it zeroes in on him, but you got to understand something. Peter did not go anywhere that the Holy Spirit didn't direct him to go. He was trusting God, he was believing God, and he wanted God to minister to him. He wanted God to direct him, and he has given everything that he is over to God, and we see a different man. We don't see Peter that grabbed the sword and was going to cut off Malchus's ear. We don't see Peter sitting there among the people lying and swearing and, and cursing that he didn't know Jesus. We don't see any of that. We see a man now that is gentle and a man that is going out, not sitting still, but going out trying to find the people and the things of God. And he comes now into this city. And it says, He went out through all quarters, and he came down also to the saints which dwell at Lydia. So he comes to Lydia, and now he's going to preach the gospel. He comes to the saints. That means he comes to the different churches that are there, and he's now in Lydia. So before we look at Peter and talk about this, I want to make a few statements to you. And number one, words can be cheap, and they can be used for self-glory. The words that we speak can be cheap. That means not of God. We can just have the ability to speak. Some have the ability to, to cut people and to hurt people. Some have the ability to talk fast. Some have the inability and talk slow. But it says that our words can be cheap. And when words are cheap, it's for self-glory. We're lifting up ourselves. You've seen people like that. I can do this, I did that, I did this, I did that. These are cheap words when we begin to talk about us and what we have accomplished and we leave God out of our life. We begin to brag, we begin to boast, we begin to lift ourselves up. So these type words can be used for self-glory. And we have to be very careful when we're dealing with godly things that we don't use cheap words and get self-glory. Cheap words would be, well, she went to the altar and I prayed for her and she got saved. I prayed for her and she got saved. You see? Cheap words. That's glorifying me. I want you to know my prayer did it. I did this. I did. So we've got to be very careful with it. Second is that godly directed works bring forth powerful miracles. Godly directed works can bring forth powerful miracles. Great things can happen when you allow God to direct your works. If someone were to come to the altar and you were to come in and pray with them, that would be works. If you get up and, and you preach under the anointing, that's works. If you get up from your house and go to work, and you go to someone there at work and you begin to share with them Jesus Christ, that's works. Anything that you do for Christ, that's your works. And godly directed works can bring forth great and powerful miracles. You can go to that person at work and share Jesus Christ with them and they can be saved. What a, what a great miracle. So keep that in mind. Godly works bring glory to God and honor the man. So when we do godly works, and there are results that are good miracles, 
then that brings glory to God and it honors the person who did the works. Because God honors them, not man. We're not talking about some man bragging on them and lifting them up because they did this. No, godly works will bring glory to God and honor to man. God will honor us for the things that we do for him. And when God honors you, that puts a check by your name. And lastly, we should strive to let our works praise us. Now, you need to think about that. We need to strive to let our works praise us. Now, what we will say is, no, that's wrong, because they're for the glory of God. But I want you to go back to the last one I read. Godly works brings glory to God and honor to man. God honors us. Therefore, we should strive to let our works praise us. Not man praising us, but God praising us. You see, there's where we have to be careful. Because our words can become cheap. Our works can become cheap. And it's for our glory. But we should do everything that we do for the honor and glory of God. And if we do, God will honor us. So we should work and strive to let everything we do praise us. Let God praise us. And it will become godly works. Do you understand that? Yeah. Man's not praising us. God is. We're not praising ourselves. God is. I want everything I do to bring honor to me from God. Now, Peter has come to Phoenicia. He left Phoenicia and he came to Lydia. And he's going to preach the gospel there. And the first thing that he does, according to this, and there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. This is a very interesting statement. Peter had been preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere he went. Now think about what would Peter, what would Peter have been preaching? The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, how God is able to do all things, that God can heal. There is nothing too hard for God. God will supply all your needs. Just think about, think about what he preached. And now he comes into Lydia, and there he meets a man. And this man has had a sickness for eight years. How did Peter get to this man? Where was this man? How old was this man? See, we don't know any of that. Was the man an eight-year-old boy? Was he a 35-year man that had been all of a sudden stricken with this disease? And for eight years he had been, we don't know. None of that's important. Did Peter go to his house and meet him? Did he meet him in the temple? Was he laying inside the road? We don't know. <laughs> God didn't tell us any of that. All he said was that Peter came to a man who had been sick for eight years. Understand this. Peter went about the country. He was preaching the gospel. He comes in to Lydia, and he meets a man. God directs him directly to this man. The same as he directed the wise men to Jesus, God directed this man, or Peter, straight to this man. And Peter looked at this man, and things changed. Now, Peter had been preaching the gospel. But I want you to know something. There comes a time in our lives when we have to confirm the gospel that we're preaching. There comes a time in our lives that when we talk about healing, that we're going to be confronted by someone that needs to be healed, that God placed us there to pray the prayer of faith with that person. And see, I don't know that we believe that. 
I was thinking this week about somebody here in the church. They came into a service one day, and they were hurting so bad, they couldn't hardly sit still. At the end of the service, or no, I think it was during the song service, they got up and came to the altar, and they knelt right there. I'll never forget it. He knelt right there, and the power of God began to come upon him, and he got up praising God and walked back to his seat with no pain whatsoever in his back. God had healed him. And I thought about it. Why did, why did God do that? And that's just one of the miracles. Why did God do that? What was, and he has praised God many times for what he did for him. There was no problem there. But you think about it. Why did God do it? And according to what he's telling us here, was God brought that miracle there for him to be able to go out with someone else who has back problems and be able to say, let me tell you what God did for me, and then begin to pray for that person. Because, see, God is going to place in our path opportunities of the gospel that we preach. And if we're going to talk about healing and we're going to testify about healing, we're going to talk about the greatness of God, we're going to talk about the salvation of God, there's going to come a point where you're going to come face to face with somebody that God has directed you to that needs the very same thing that God healed you of or delivered you from and he's going to put you there for you to pray for that person in faith that they can be delivered also. Amen. See, it's not just so we can get a healing and say, God, heal me. It's not for that. There's got to be something after it. And the power that did it to you is the power that God wants you to use to go to somebody else and tell them. Peter had had some great miracles in his life. And now all of a sudden, he has got to confirm it. It's face to face. He's got to do something. He's got to show something. He's got to let his faith rise up and begin to do something powerful in his life because he's been preaching about the power of God. And if you preach about the power of God, you talk about the power of God, somewhere you're going to have to have the faith to show it in the way that you live and the way that you pray. So he's got him sitting there. Peter came face to face with that opportunity. All of a sudden, it was no more talking. All the talking was over with. We're face to face. God led him to a man that had been sick for eight years, laying in a bed, face to face. Now, is your gospel real? Do you believe your gospel? Do you think that God can use you to do what you've been saying God can do? Because God has to have an instrument. Do you think it? And how many times has God brought you to somebody face to face and they say to you, I need you to pray for me. I'm so and so. And you said, we will and walked away. The very thing that you needed to do, the thing that you say you believe face to face. How many times have we failed? How many times have we prayed for somebody but didn't have faith? We just said a prayer. We threw up a Hail Mary. How many times have we missed the opportunity to let God show his power through one of us? Not for our glory, but for his in Jesus' name. This man was sick. Whatever disease he had, it was incurable. He was helpless. Everything that happened to that man, somebody else had to do. He couldn't move a muscle. He could not do anything. Now think about how horrible that would be. You had to feed him. You had to clean him. You had to put him to bed. You had to get him out of bed. Everything that happened to that man in his life, for eight years, somebody else had to do. Not only was it bad for that man, he was suffering it, but it's bad for those people that are having to do it. Even though they may love him, and even though they, you know, they can say, we don't mind doing it, still, everything in their life centered around that man. And Peter, 
comes face to face with this man that is hopeless, that nothing can be done for him, totally dependent, helpless, waiting on somebody else. But then we see something about Peter. It said, And Peter said to this man, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Now arise, take up your bed. And he arose immediately. Face to face with this man. And Peter looked at him and he said, Aeneas, Jesus Christ is going to heal you today. The power of Jesus Christ is going to deliver you. Peter understood that it wasn't him. Peter had nothing and no power outside of God. And he didn't walk there and just say, now I'm going to pray with you and I want you to believe. I'm going to lay my hands on you now. I'm going to anoint you with oil. You've got to have faith and believe. No. Peter instructed him. And he said, Jesus Christ and his power is fixing to touch you. See, that's what the church misses today. We've been taught to anoint, to pray, to say this word, to say that, do this, do this. And we do all that. And nothing happens. And we walk away and we say, well, he'll be here one day when he gets to heaven. And he may be, if he makes it to heaven. But the thing about it is the fact that Jesus wanted to heal him today. And there was no one to step up face to face. Nobody to have faith. Nobody to pray that prayer. Nobody to believe in Christ and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Something's wrong with the church today. We don't believe in miracles anymore. We really don't. The church doesn't act like it believes in miracles anymore. Someone comes to the altar, it's a bother. Now it's going to delay the service. Now how are we going to do anything? It becomes a bother to us. And we don't want to come up and pray for them because if we come up and pray for them, God may touch them. If God touches them, somebody else is going to come and the Spirit's going to fall and we're going to be here all day. See, we don't want that anymore. We've walked away from it. We're just happy to come in here and sing a few songs, sit in your chairs, let me say a few words or a lot of words, and then you say amen and get up and go home, and we've been to church. And there's where the church has evolved to. And there's no power in the church. The real joy of God is not in the church. The strength of God is not being shown in the church. Even though we go through all the motions, every one of them, and nothing happens. Peter walked up that day with compassion. See, we didn't see this in Peter, the old, the old Peter. Compassion. Because he looked on that, he looked at that man. He cared about that man. And he wanted to remove that man's misery. He really did. He wanted to make him well, wanted to make him whole. But he knew that in order to do that, a great miracle was needed. And Peter understood that he did not have the power within himself to do a great miracle. All he had was the power in himself to pray maybe a great prayer. But that's all it was, was words. Remember I told you to begin with, words can be cheap and bring self-glory. Peter understood that. And he wanted to do something. So Peter thought for a moment. And he had to think, I can't do it. But I know who can. I'm serving that God. I've given my life to that God. And I know that he can. Again, it says, And Peter said to the man, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Right now. Not when you get to heaven. 
Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. And rise and make your bed. And he rose immediately. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. When? Right now while I'm talking. The power of God hit Aeneas as Peter spoke. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole now. When he said that, Aeneas now has a problem. Does he believe? And the Bible doesn't tell us whether Aeneas was saved or not. There are times that God will heal sinners. That's called mercy. So we don't know anything about this man, except he was eight years helpless. And he said to him, Jesus Christ, healeth you. Peter spoke that in faith, in the power of God. Now the man must believe. If he was a sinner, he still had to believe what Peter said. It's not that he believed in the power of God if he was a sinner. He believed what Peter said. Maybe he didn't understand it, but he believed it somehow. And God worked. If he was a Christian, and Peter spoke those words, he had to believe in God. That it was happening in his life right now. And there are a lot of us, we come for prayer. And we'll say, oh, I need special prayer. And you'll come to the front and we'll pray for you. But you don't have the faith to be healed. You just want to be prayed for. I mean, that's the thing to do. They say if you come up front and pray, you can be healed. Well, that sounds like a formula to me. And God doesn't work that way. We can say it, but God doesn't work that way. God is depending on the power to work through someone. He wants someone of faith if two or more gather together. Okay, so we get three. Now we got two or more, so we can pray and anything's going to happen. I don't think so, because that's not what that verse says. That's what not, not what God's Word said. It takes somebody that is directed by God face-to-face -face with that encounter where you're going to have to somehow confirm your faith, confirm what you believe. You're going to have to be able to pray that prayer. And it's not something you turn on when you're walking down here like a spigot of water. It's something you live every day of your life because you never know when you're going to come face to face. It may be in Walmart. It may be on your job. It may be at school. It may be here in the church, but it's going to happen. And it won't happen just one time. It will happen as many times as God knows he can trust you. The miracles that we need, we got to believe for them. So this man now has to believe the power of God is there because Peter's already spoken it. So now things become, and I want you to look at this. It says that Peter said that, and that the, he says, Arise, make your bed, and he arose immediately. Arise. That was the faith of God working in that man. That man's faith. Peter's faith. Arise, man's faith. And it says, and he arose. That is God's power. When man has faith, God's power begins to work. A helpless, crippled man with no hope now has faith, and he arises through the power of God. Whatever we need, when we have the faith to believe in the power of God, and it's not just words, when it's in your heart, God can bring great miracles. We need them today, church. Every one of us need a great miracle in our family. We need it. Face to face. Think about the fact that that man's family, whoever it was, for eight years didn't have that encounter. Did, did, not, did, not, did not believe. Couldn't pray. 
Think about the people in the churches that Peter was visiting. None of them. It was Peter's day. Peter's day. Remember another story where he came face to face with a crippled man? Silver and gold have we none, but what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. <laughs> do you have the faith? If you do, God has the power. And we need to take that today and trust it today and let God. That man was weak and helpless, but he became healthy and strong. Weak and helpless, healthy and strong. That's what we need today, that transition from here to here. And let the power of God change our lives. When we're blessed, God wants us to go bless other people. Whenever God performs a miracle for you, whatever it is, he wants you to take that and go to somebody else and deliver the message to them face to face. And I don't care if it's as simple as you having to bake a cake and you're not sure how it's going to turn out and you pray and you ask God to help you and you have the most beautiful cake you've ever had and you want to praise God for that cake. God expects you to take that miracle right there and go to somebody else and say, listen, I was having trouble baking a cake the other day, but God helped me and he's going to help you. You're going to have a beautiful cake. It's that simple. Everything that God does for us, no matter how simple or how great, he does it for us to go help somebody else. And we need to get busy and get about his business. Many people have good words, but very few people have good works. We can talk a good talk. You just let God heal you. you just, we can talk a good talk, but it's the works. It's that face-to-face -face encounter, our works. Are we willing to believe and pray the prayer of faith? Or are we scared? Are we ashamed? Whatever. But can you do it in the name of Jesus? Good words, and we have a lot of that. But it's the good works that makes a difference in your life and other people's lives. You need to vow today to begin to let your works glorify God. Because if they do, they'll honor us. And we need that. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your blessed word. Lord, you show us that you can take a horrible man like Paul and make a great man out of him. You can take someone like Peter who was loud and boisterous and a bully and make a compassionate, caring man out of him. So Lord, that means you can use anybody in this church today, anybody watching it, you can use them. All we have to do is be willing to be used. And I pray God that you would reach out this morning let every one of us take these words to heart. Let us begin to believe that we can make a difference. See, everything you've ever done for us was designed for us to use it to help someone else see and understand and have faith in you. Everything. You didn't do it because you just picked us out and loved us more than you loved somebody else. You had a purpose and a plan. God, let us be willing to say and do whatever you want us to and to be able to have the boldness and the strength and the courage to reach out to other people because miracles are waiting. There are people that have been down eight years that should not have been. People that's been hurting for so long that should not have been because there was no one there to help them. Let us be the one. Let us go in your name. Let us have that faith that we need and just help us to be everything you want us to be. We love you and we thank you for it. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.